Greetings, everyone. My name is Amal Matu, and I'm faculty here at University of Maryland, and welcome to our Crashing Patient Conference. For those of you that are interested in getting CME credit for the lectures that you're going to see, you can get CME credit on EMED Home. Check it out at www.emedhome.com. And for those people that want live lectures, we're going to be right back here in October of 2013. Hope to see you then. All right, well, greetings, everyone. We're going to spend a little time talking about amiodarone. Where is the black box? We figured we'd inject a little controversy in the series of lectures with this talk. As many of you know, that there's a lot of great, great medications that have been black boxed over the past handful of years for various reasons. And just to be a little controversial, I'm going to suggest why has an amiodarone been thrown into the black box as well? Let's briefly talk about amiodarone. As we all know, amiodarone was first really, really introduced into popular medical use back in 2000 when the American Heart Association endorsed the use of amiodarone for cardiac arrest. Uh, in 2000, the HA guidelines put amiodarone as a class 2B rating and dropped lidocaine, which had previously been considered the drug of choice, to an indeterminate rating. And so the popular marketing at the time was that amiodarone should be considered the preferred drug in cardiac arrest. And because of that, everyone fell in love with amiodarone and started using amiodarone for everything. People said, hey, you know, if your patient has a PVC, put them on amiodarone, put their family members on amiodarone, put the nursing staff on amiodarone and the patients in the next room, put them on amiodarone also. But when you start taking a look at the evidence, amiodarone may not be quite as good as we were all led to believe. First point, cardiac arrest. In 2005, the American Heart Association finally came out and said, well, you know, in 2000, we said amiodarone is really great. It turns out that it doesn't actually work. And this is a quote from right out of the American Heart Association guidelines in 2000, saying there is no actual evidence that any antiarrhythmic works uh, when patients, or human patients, that is, are in cardiac arrest. You can use it in animals, I suppose. But human cardiac arrest, there is no drugs that have been found to be effective in cardiac arrest. So you can use amiodarone if you want, but mm, it doesn't really work. And now in 2012, we know it's all about BLS, not ALS. Drugs don't make much of a difference. But it took five years before the American Heart Association actually published this, and a lot of people were being... Uh, they have their elbows and arms twisted into using amiodarone. What else? This is not commonly taught, but amiodarone should really be avoided in patients that are pregnant. Amiodarone is a class D antiarrhythmic, which means it's clearly considered to be harmful. Uh, it is um, probably the only class D antiarrhythmic. Beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, lidocaine, procainamide, all the rest of them are generally considered Bs and probably more commonly Cs. Why is amiodarone considered a class D antiarrhythmic? Well, it's because it causes fetal hypothyroidism, intrauterine growth retardation, fetal bradycardia, prematurity. There's a high, relatively high iodine content in amiodarone. And the general recommendations are do everything possible to avoid using amiodarone, even shock the patient. Cardioversion and defibrillation are considered far safer in ventricular fibrillation and pulseless VTAC compared to amiodarone. So stay away from amiodarone in all stages, not just third trimester, but all stages of pregnancy. What about atrial fibrillation with preexcitation or Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome? This is also not commonly taught, but is not really considered safe. Here's a 12 lead EKG sent to me by the person that runs EMED Home, Dr. Rick Nunes. He had a relatively young patient that came in with this very, very rapid uh, wide complex tachycardia, the QRS complexes are changing in morphology. In some places, the rate's approaching 300 beats per minute. That's your classic atrial fibrillation with WPW. The AHA guidelines suggest the possibility of using amiodarone. It's not really a safe drug. And here's how we learned this the hard way. This is a patient with AFib and WPW. We gave the patient amiodarone, and the patient went right into ventricular fibrillation. Fortunately, we shocked him out of it, but then we went and took a look at the literature. And if you look at the world's literature, there's really no good supporting evidence from research studies or case series saying that 
If you have rapid AFib with WPW and you use IV amiodarone, that there's really great outcomes. In fact, this is just a handful of the articles that are out there in the world's literature indicating decompensation after patients with rapid AFib and WPW were given IV amiodarone. The world's literature suggests at most that it's probably not a good drug. So stay away from AFib, stay away from amiodarone in AFib and WPW. It actually makes sense when you think about the mechanism of the drug. Amiodarone has beta blocker and calcium channel blocking effects. In other words, amiodarone is part AV nodal blocker and we know that AV nodal blockers are deadly in AFib and WPW, so stay away from, pro, uh, from amiodarone. What else? Well, when amiodarone first came out, people started saying, well, what about amiodarone if there's a prolonged QT? It doesn't really affect the QT much, does it? What about PVCs? None of us like seeing PVCs. PVCs perhaps predict ventricular tachycardia or VFib. So if you see PVCs, let's put them all on amiodarone and see what happens. Well. We once again learned the hard way that amiodarone is not good for these patients. Here's an alcoholic who came in with palpitations. He's got, as you can see, a lot of ventricular ectopy. You might also appreciate that he's got a somewhat prolonged QT. That was missed. Everyone just focused on the ventricular ectopy. He had a prolonged QT because he was, just like all alcoholics, hypomagnesemic and also a bit hypokalemic. The patient got amiodarone to get rid of the PVCs and during the amiodarone bolus, he went right into torsade. No big surprise there. Here's another patient, 66 year old woman who presented with chest pain and a pretty good story for admission. Uh, the QTC you see up here is 464 milliseconds, it's pretty normal. But there's PVCs here and the admitting team wasn't happy to see PVCs. So the admitting team said, you know what? We're gonna get woken up by the nurses all night. If we don't get rid of these PVCs, let's try some amiodarone. So they start the patient on amiodarone. Sure enough, the PVCs are gone. They didn't happen to notice, however, that the QT is now a lot longer. QTC is 562 milliseconds. And it turned out that they did get woken up that night by the nursing staff when the patient went into this. And this was pretty much their expression. The patient went into torsade. So they quickly stopped the amiodarone, put the patient on a magnesium infusion, and the QT came right back down to 480. Bottom line, please remember, amiodarone is part sodium channel blocker also, and it's gonna prolong the QT. Here's another case, another case where we learned this the hard way. 55 year old man who's taking methadone, and we know that methadone prolongs the QTC. His QTC is 551 milliseconds, normal being less than 490, less than 480 or so. He's got a very, very prolonged QT, and he was intermittently developing runs of torsade. In fact, his wife brought him into the hospital because how he was having occasional syncopal episodes. Well, they shocked him out of that episode of torsade. Now you gotta put him on something to prevent him from going back into it. What do they chose to do? They chose to use amiodarone. So he gets started on amiodarone and now his QTC increases to 653 milliseconds and no surprise, he went right back into torsade and had to be shocked multiple, multiple times. Then finally they got him out of it, stopped the amiodarone, started him on a magnesium infusion. So again, they learned the hard way that amiodarone prolongs the QT and is not safe just for PVCs. It's not safe for anyone with the prolonged QT. What else? Why complex tachycardias that are associated with hyperkalemia? This is not a safe time to use amiodarone either. What a lot of people may not realize is hyperkalemia poisons the sodium channels. So the last thing you wanna do is put these patients on a medication that is a sodium channel blocker in and of itself. So hyperkalemia or any drug toxicity prolonging the QT or blocking sodium channels, you stay away from amiodarone. Once again, let me show you how we learned this the hard way. This was an inpatient who was hyperkalemic. Now the physicians didn't know the potassium was 9.2. All they saw was this wide complex tachycardia. The morphologies are changing a little bit, but I don't think they really noticed that. They just said, this is a wide complex tachycardia and the patient was relatively stable. So they said, let's use a medication. They put the patient on amiodarone and he went right into asystole and died later they discovered that his potassium was 9.2. 
amiodarone is not safe in the presence of hyperkalemia. Here's another case. The patient has a wide complex, kind of a bizarre looking uh, tachycardia. The rate's 105. This was due to hyperkalemia as well. Unfortunately, the physicians didn't realize it. They said, wide complex tachycardia, we got to get rid of it. Let's try some amiodarone. So an amiodarone bolus was given over five minutes. And towards the end of that five-minute bolus, the patient had a brady asystolic arrest. Then after they pronounced the patient later on, they discovered that the patient's initial potassium with this top rhythm strip was actually about uh, 8.0. So hyperkalemia poisons the sodium channels and can mimic VTAC with wide complex tachycardias. If you suspect hyperkalemia, don't use amiodarone. You're gonna knock out those sodium channels. Here's another time when amiodarone can be dangerous. <clears throat> this is a wide complex tachycardia, but in this case, you'll notice the rate is not that fast. The rate here is only about 110. When you see a wide complex tachycardia with the rate that's under 120, don't call it VTAC. This is not VTAC. This is actually accelerated idioventricular rhythm. This is a patient who recently got thrombolytics for a STEMI, now develops this rhythm. This is called AIVR, or accelerated idioventricular rhythm. This is a reperfusion arrhythmia. When you see this rhythm, you should be happy. You should give your patient a high five. It means their artery has opened up because of the thrombolytics that you've given the patient. Unfortunately, the physicians taking care of this patient misdiagnosed this as VTAC. They didn't realize that you have to have a heart rate of at least 120 before you call something VTAC. They called this patient VTAC, even though the heart rate's only about 110 or so, and the drug they chose to use was amiodarone, and it put this patient right into asystole, and the patient could not be resuscitated. When you see this rhythm, you simply put your hands in your pockets and observe the patient. You don't treat this patient with lidocaine, amiodarone, procainamide. None of those drugs should be given. And again, they panicked, they called it VTAC, and they used amiodarone. Amiodarone is deadly with accelerated idioventricular rhythm. You just observe the patient. But you know what? We still have amiodarone for ventricular tachycardia, right? Amiodarone has got to still be useful for ventricular tachycardia. Well, maybe not. See, amiodarone was considered the drug of choice back in the, the last decade, the early part of the 2000s, uh, because everyone thought, well, amiodarone is good for ventricular fibrillation. It's got to be at least good for ventricular tachycardia as well. Well, they ended up studying it. Isn't it terrible when you study things and find out that what you thought as dogma turned out to not be true? And this is one of the studies that got put out. Stable patients with ventricular tachycardia were given amiodarone, and it only worked in 29% of cases. This is published in Annals of Emergency Medicine. 29%, that's right around where lidocaine is. Remember, we got rid of lidocaine when amiodarone came around. Turns out amiodarone is only about as effective as lidocaine, 29%. In that same mission of Annals of Emergency Medicine, they, uh, Richard Cummins published an editorial saying, well, you know, back in 2000, when we said amiodarone is this great drug, even for VTAC, we were actually uh, making that claim based on older research, which even then showed amiodarone was only effective in about 40 to 60% of cases. So amiodarone's never been that good for stable VTAC. This study says 29%. Let's move forward a couple of years. In 2008, European journal, Emergency Medicine Journal, did a similar study. They looked at stable patients with VTAC. They gave them amiodarone, the so-called drug of choice, and it was only effective, once again, in 29% of cases. Well, some people might say, well, amiodarone is great because if it works, it works very quickly. Maybe not, because in this study, they found that even when amiodarone worked, only 15% of the time did it convert the patients quickly within 20 minutes. So it's neither fast nor effective. So based on studies like this, back in 2006, the American, take a look at these organizations, American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, and the European Society of Cardiology got together. Now anytime these three major organizations get together and say something, it's worth listening to. They got together in 2006 and put together what they refer to as an executive summary, essentially talking about how 
we should be taking care of patients with ventricular arrhythmias. Now, a lot of this is a bit more relevant to the cardiologists, but the one main point that these guys came up with in 2006 for, that's relevant to emergency medicine is procainamide. Procainamide is back. They said procainamide is the drug of to choice. This is in 2006 in circulation, the main journal of the American Heart Association. Why this didn't get a lot more pub publicity, I'm not really sure. These are quotes from right out of this international executive summary. IV amiodarone is not ideal for early conversion of stable monomorphic VTAC. IV procainamide is more appropriate when early slowing of the VTAC rate and termination of monomorphic VTAC are desired. Amiodarone can cause hypotension, bradycardia, and prolongation of the QT interval. Again, that's not well publicized, but they talked about this in this particular circulation article. They said IV amiodarone is reasonable for patients with sustained monomorphic VTAC that's hemodynamically unstable, refractory to conversion with countershock, or recurrent despite procainamide or other agents. So what they're saying is that amiodarone can be used after you've already tried other agents first. It's not the ideal agent. Well, finally, in 2010, the American Heart Association finally caught up with the literature and downgraded, or rather put procainamide as a higher class rating than amiodarone based on the literature that we already had. Procainamide is class 2A and amiodarone class 2B for stable patients with ventricular tachycardia. Once again, key point, procainamide is back. It's back in line. And for those of you that are young and have never used procainamide before, procainamide is here. Start using procainamide. It is the first line drug of choice if you have stable VTAC. Quite honestly, uh, you know, don't hesitate to just sedate and shock these patients. I think we've really gone too far away from shocking patients. Sedate and shock patients is faster, most reliable, quickest way of uh, taking care of patients with stable VTAC. But if you really don't want to cardiovert somebody and you want to use a drug for stable VTAC, procainamide is the way to go based on literature. Remember, amiodarone appears to only be effective in about the same numbers as lidocaine. 20, 29% or so, not that great. So quick summary, it's important to remember this. Amiodarone is not ideal for everything. In fact, the studies say that amiodarone is dangerous in a handful of cases. It's dangerous in pregnancy, dangerous in AFib with WPW. For prophylaxis against VTAC, when you see PVCs, it's dangerous. If you have a long QT, dangerous, hyperkalemia, dangerous, and accelerated idioventricular rhythm, amiodarone is dangerous as well. And there's a few other cases where it may not be dangerous, but poorly effective or ineffective. In cardiac arrest, it doesn't work. And in patients with stable VTAC, it doesn't work most of the time. Percainamide is better. And the final key point I'll just leave you with is amiodarone is not a cure-all. Back in 2000, amiodarone was force-fed to all of us as the greatest drug ever for patients with ventricular arrhythmias. It's not a cure-all, and in fact, it has some serious, serious limitations and some dangers associated with it. So if you want to use amiodarone, fine, but just be very, very careful. Make sure you know all the limitations associated with amiodarone, and make sure you know those times when amiodarone can actually be deadly. So my question once again, where is the black box for amiodarone? It really should be in there. We've got better drugs that are safer. Final reminder, once again, please remember the Crashing Patient Conference is gonna be at the end of October 2013 here in Baltimore, and um, I hope to see you all there. Thank you all very much.